Hello everybody, it's Friday night and I'm recording another video for you. I hope this one is helpful. Uh, so I got some questions during my class uh, this month. Uh, I'm teaching another class, online class on uh, digital portraits. And uh, one of my students questioned about, you know, what are the main problems that I see with, uh, you know, facial structure and likeness. And I thought about, you know, it's like describing a little bit of my process. Uh, hopefully this is not going to be a super long video. But uh, just giving a couple of hints, you know, it's like of things that you can try to do and probably avoid to keep the structure of your uh, model, you know, it's like the facial structure in a good spot um, so it doesn't look funny when you look from different angles. And uh, some of the other things, you know, it's like you can try to do to improve your model. So I'm going to use as an example my current model, the one I'm actually sculpting during the class. We are on uh, at the end of uh, week number two, so we still have another two weeks to go. And uh, let me just share what I have uh, so far. Um, let me just uh, set this up for you. So this is the current model um, that I have. Uh, I just slapped today like this texture that came from a previous model. So it's not like his actual texture that, you know, it's like the albedo color. Uh, just to see how things are working at this point. So basically, this is the previous version without the texture. This is just like a, just a shader without any textures. And this one is the one with the texture. And some tweaks, obviously, the ears changed in there a little bit. Um, yeah, so profile, you know, it's like trying to render from different angles and see how the forms are behaving at this point. But uh, I cannot show you a lot here inside of Maya because definitely like, you know, it's like my model is going to be um, at this point, just like a shaded mode like that, right? So I cannot actually show you uh, things that detailed, but I can actually switch to my ZBrush in here. So we have the same model here in ZBrush. And then let's uh, try to explore a little bit of what I'm doing with this model here. Uh, it's still in progress and likeness is really hard, you know, it's like to nail correctly. And sometimes it can take a long, long time. So I'm using multiple references here. This is Frank Frazetta one of my favorite artists ever. Um, uh, back in the day in Brazil, I used to buy this little magazine called Crypta, which in in, uh, in America, I think was called Creepy. And the covers are basically, you know, it's like the, the, the nicest ones are all done by Frazetta. And uh, he also illustrated for Heavy Metal, you know, it's like amazing, amazing artist. He did all the cool Conan illustrations, right? Like all the amazing, really amazing stuff. Like he used to paint in oils, like fantasy style. And those oil paintings ended up like on in the cover of comics, you know, it's like really, really incredible stuff. So I'm trying to find, you know, it's like a, an age that actually can, you know, base my sculpture on. He got uh, very different as he got older. This is like a picture of him. There's this one here as well, different age. And uh, so what I try to do normally, I try to collect as many pictures as I can, but as I, but I, as you can tell here, I mean, like, uh, none of them have a super high resolution. They are mostly, like, low-resolution pictures taken from the Internet. And uh, I actually use this as a, as a, an incentive, you know, because I want to make sure that I can create something that looks, like, realistic without having to be a one-to-one -one representation of what I'm seeing. And that gives you a lot of freedom, you know, it's like because, yeah, obviously you can actually, I'm not going to say cheat, but you can actually reimagine things, you know, it's like you can actually idealize certain things that are not actually in the model. So obviously for primary and secondary forms, which are basically like the, you know, it's like the structure of the face itself at the bigger folds and, and volumes, uh, you cannot get away too much from, right? Like otherwise you're going to lose the likeness. But in terms of the fine detail, there's a lot I can get away with. You know, it's like that's why when you get like to my renders here, you can actually start seeing, uh, you know, it's like some detail is starting to be being sculpted in there. And then I can show you in ZBrush as well how the, the detail looks in ZBrush at this point. But all this stuff here is basically being reimagined, you know, it's like it's not part of any of my super low resolution references. So that's uh, what I try to do, you know, it's like uh, imagine like if you have someone like uh, that who died like like 200 years ago. You're not gonna have pictures of that person, right? So uh, if you can reimagine and understand the structure, structures of the skin and try to recreate that, you know, it's like it, you can actually create something that looks realistic and believable, but without having to be like a one-to-one -one translation of what you're seeing, right? So I think this is the best of both worlds because it gives me a lot of flexibility. 
So uh, in his case here, uh, let me just use his uh, face restructure as an example of the things that I notice the most. Okay, so some of the the most common mistakes that I see people uh, doing when it comes like to uh, uh, to face restructure and and cranium volumes and things like that. So starting with the cranium volume. I would say that the cranial volume is very important because it helps to create the frame of the face, right? Sometimes you get like a nice match for the face itself, but then either the cranium is too large or too small, and then that starts like to compromise the 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 structure, you know, it's like the the structure of the face itself because you start starting to get, get like for example like if the ears are too open or too bared into the skull, you know, it's like you're going to get a different result. If uh, your sternocleidomastoid, this muscle right here that connects all the way to your sternum and to your clavicle in here, if it's too large sometimes, you know, it's like it's something like that that's too big, you know, it's like a, it depends obviously of your character. I mean, like if it's a very strong person, you're probably going to have a very developed like neck muscle right here, right? You're going to have something like that, like I'm going to bulge. But uh, overall, I mean, like uh, if you're sculpting a woman, for example, and you want to make sure that it's uh, someone very feminine, uh, you're not going to be sculpting this sternocleidomastoid like super, super uh, strong, right? Like you're going to try to create some kind of like soft uh, transitions. So right around here, for example, the trapezius, you're going to try to create something that is a little bit like a, in women, for example, the neck is a little bit more lean and like the, the shoulders kind of like they ease like that a little bit instead of like having someone very muscled, right? Like we're going to have like very developed uh, uh, trapezius. So this is like a, the first thing. So keep an eye out for the structure of the character you're trying to sculpt or model. And uh, so that starts with that, you know, it's like uh, if it's someone who is fairly strong, but not like a bodybuilder, right? Like be careful with the volumes, don't go too crazy with them, right? But uh, back to the f uh, to the head structure in here. Uh, normally when I try to sculpt something and I try to uh, interpret the, 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 the volume of the cranium without having a direct reference, imagine I don't have any scans for this model, right? Like in, even like my... Uh, my uh, different uh, photo references I have in there. I don't have a lot of clues about this. And on top of that, he has a ton of hair. So I try to create some kind of like an average uh, head volume sometimes. So uh, I would say like I, I get as a reference here, I have reference point. If I sculpt something here so you actually can see, if I get the reference point for my zygomatic in here, I try to keep going with it all the way to the back, kind of like a curve like this. And that would be pretty close to the deepest part of the cranium in here. So I could actually remove some of this volume here and actually consider that one as being like the, you know, it's like the, 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 the kind of like the deepest point of the skull right there. So for example, here I could potentially just go and just like, let's get this a little bit more like that. I'm gonna remove some of that. So kind of go back a little bit. And this volume right here, I would actually start getting a little bit more square towards this, right? Like I'm gonna tap a little bit like that. So I'm gonna get this nice little curvature with a little point. It's a little bit like the 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 you know it's like the deepest point in there. What happens underneath in here is that uh, there's a let me just sketch in here for you again. So you're gonna see like a there is a little bit of a, there is a bone that goes underneath here. It's called the this one is the mastoid process, right? So it connects to the sternocleidomastoid. So that's the large muscle that you see going from here all the way down. So it connects from that point and then from internally like that, it's gonna go all the way like that, right? So you're gonna get this larger portion, I'm gonna go. And obviously one of the one of the the tentacles in here, let's call it tentacle, it's gonna connect like to the sternum itself, right? And then the other one, another little arm in here is gonna connect more towards your clavicle. So we're gonna get something like that. So uh, those structures here, uh, here are very important to represent, you know, because this changes the profile of the neck completely. Okay, so if you don't have this in the correct spot, like this whole relationship of, uh, you know, it's like going towards the back of the head, nothing here works. So, uh, you know, it's like another thing you can do, obviously you can just continue that line just to define, you know, it's like you can add a little V in here because you have a little volume coming that way. And right here in the middle, for example, I could hollow it a little bit like that. And then maybe build a little bit vo more volume on the side and continue this volume 
all the way down towards the trapezius, right? Uh, but then, uh, so the, the volume of the head, like from the profile, it's trying to consider those things, you know? Uh, then from the side in here, there's another important landmark that you're gonna notice. It's, uh, you have your temporalis or temporal line. So the temporal line is basically like this. So you're gonna have like your bone structure. You're gonna have a line that goes around here and it's gonna cut around here. And then that becomes your your zygomatic bone, which is this one here, right? So your zygomatic, zygomatic bone right there. So this line here is gonna continue and it's gonna go all the way across and towards the back. And it's a large muscle, like kind of like sketching here. So uh, this is an important line because what's gonna happen, it's gonna give you a, a clue about where you're gonna have to break up the direction here a little bit. So you saw like when I turned from the front in here, so around here, try to imagine that this entire area here, I could potentially add a little bit more of a change in direction. So basically like I would have this line a little bit sharper in here and it would actually, you know, it's like a change. So it's so slightly round in here and then slightly square starting from here, kind of like, you know, it's like just a little division between those two uh, uh, surfaces, just so you can understand the changing planes. You know, it's like everything is about changing those planes. And by that, I mean like uh, the areas when you, uh, is squint, for example, or when you make your character very tiny in the screen like that. If you can still notice those planes, for example, you can see a very strong one on the sides of the face right here, right? And then now with uh, with my temporalis muscle defining here by temporalis uh, by the temporal line, you can actually see there's another plane be being created in there. Uh, some people like to actually sketch those planes in the model itself to define those those things very clearly. Let me just undo here since I already explained that part. Uh, so let's see, a little bit more. There you go. Okay, so some people, they actually like to sketch and define those planes very well. So let me just, first let me turn off my texture in here. And uh, a brush that's good to do this, I mean like you can use one of those uh, uh, planar brushes or polish brush. Let's try with, um, let's see, let's try with the flattened one. So there's this flattened brush right here. And this one, for example, you can actually use for this kind of thing, you know? So I can actually really define the plane. So if, if I wanted to stylize this model, I would actually try to find those angles, right? Like that make, you know, it's like a, things cast the shadows in a certain way and that really define where the direction is changing, you know, it's like, so I'm gonna make a little bit squarish right here, maybe a little squarish right here. So what's happening underneath in here, you're gonna have your zygomatic bone, but then you have your zygomatic major, which is this muscle that runs underneath right here from the very corner of the zygomatic bone. So you're gonna have the bone right there, a little exaggerated. So right here, this one is gonna connect to the corner of the mouth, right? And then the zygomatic uh, minor is actually gonna connect more towards the center around here. Connecting, uh, yeah, so it's gonna pull more like the center area. So those two ones are the most visible ones here. You have some other structures underneath here that you can actually, you know, it's like ignore for now because those are the ones gonna be more visible. Uh, this, this are the ones that basically like if someone models creatures, for example, it's not uncommon to see someone modeling a creature or even a human like stylized human, you know, it's like in really exaggerating, you know, it's like the zygomatic muscle here. People like to do like this contraction. It's like, looks so fierce, right? Um, but uh, I mean, like if someone, for example, if it's a, a person who is uh, emaciated, you know, it's like we're very dehydrated. You can watch like this UFC fighters during the, uh, you know, it's like during their uh, weigh in. And you're gonna see some of them with those structures, structures very, very visible, you know, it's like because they're super dehydrated. But uh, let, going back here to the, to our, uh, let's see, flatten. Going back to our planes, just like I was saying before, I can actually define a plane right here in the temporalis, right? Another one on the side of the face right here. You have your masseter in here. The masseter, the position of the masseter goes like this. So you're gonna have like, let's say like if you have a corner right here of your mandible. So starting from the zygomatic bone right here, you're gonna create almost like it opens up just a little bit like this. So you're gonna have like, you know, this kind of like structure right here. This would be your masseter. And then there's another part that comes from the top, obviously. Uh, this there is a there is actually a hook in here. So if you consider 
the psychomatic bone, there's a psychomatic arch right around here, and there's a hole. So right around here, there's a hole, and then the muscles actually go, you know, it's like start from the temporalis, and some of them actually go over there and help with this whole structure here, right? Like kind of like pulling the, the your jaw up, right? Like it's everything is connected. And uh, so, you know, it's like with those structures in mind, you know, it's like I, obviously I recommend uh, some anatomy books for you to, to check out. Um, you know, it's like with those structures in place, you can actually start defining those planes because you know that if a certain muscle happens in a certain way underneath the skin, you're actually going to get this type of like, you know, it's like if you want to stylize, you're going to get this type of structure that looks very, very flat overall. So I would say like start with a... a a little bit more like stylized model just like slightly and then from that point we're going to start actually looking for the volume of the head so the volume of the head is important get the cranium cranium in a in a correct spot but also uh orbiting around your model at all times the problem with orbiting around the model when you don't you don't have like a good lens uh setup is that it becomes very funny right like i mean if i go to my drawing here and i switch my camera lens to like 35 for example what happens in here is a distortion right it's like uh if i use the let's say like a fisheye lens uh everything here for example the face would look like a caricature and the eyes would get much bigger the nose especially is you would get like much much bigger and the ears would basically disappear they would disappear be behind the mask of the face if you have like a very wide angle angle wide angle lens but then uh if you go for example like to something more like a 50 or a 85 things start getting more flat right and if you go to a no perspective then you get that very flat face like that uh so this is the first thing you have to do, you know, it's like to set up your lens in a way that uh, the model uh, looks a little bit more like natural to look at. So if you consider that uh, your eyes, for example, the human eye has an equivalent lens, maybe like 60 to 65 millimeters lens. Uh, so, you know, it's like that's basically what you expect to see when you're looking at someone. So if something is too flat or too wide, you start to notice that you know uh, when it comes to portraits normally like there's no rule obviously uh, people have different preferences but by uh, like normally if you have a photo that's kind of like from the waist up something around here uh, normally a 50, 50 millimeters is uh, it's uh, you know uh, something that you can use uh, if you have like a full body maybe a 35 a 35 would be good right so you don't need a lot of space to take that picture and obviously the distortion is kind of going to go away a little bit especially on the face because you're looking from a very long distance but then as you get closer and closer to the face let's say like a shoulder and head uh, 85 to 100 millimeters would be more you know more interesting to use you would create a little bit more of a, a more neutral look to the face without having a lot of distortion so kind of simulating a little bit of your human eye in a way uh, but then if you get a super close-up, let's say like a head shot like that, that would be probably like between 100 and 135 would be more interesting, you know, as so it could look more natural. Because ZBrush doesn't have yet a super precise camera, they really improved it, you know, it's like this camera is much better. But um, still uh, not 100% accurate according to my test, like with Maya, you know, it's like, a, but it's much better than it was for sure. But uh, uh, what I try to do is to keep something between 50 and 85. So if I type manually here, 70, for example, something like that, I think it looks a little bit more natural, you know? So starting with that, then you can start looking at your references. But obviously, for, from time to time, you're gonna get references. Let's say someone is in the red carpet, uh, a celebrity, right? Like if you're modeling a celebrity. And then if someone is in the red carpet, you can be sure that the, the paparazzi taking the picture is using a very long lens, maybe like a 200 millimeters, even 300 millimeters if it's a fair, fairly long distance. And in that case, they are probably going to be flattening the face quite a lot. So you're going to see a lot of like very flat faces, meaning like you're going to have like both ears very visible. Um, and then all of that, I mean, like you're gonna have to try to cross reference with whatever you're seeing here. So if it's a more like a candid shot, like something like this, right? It's more likely that someone took the picture here with a 50 or a 35 millimeters. And then something more like, a, let's say like a, 
uh, more professional photo if that's the case probably like someone would try 85 or something like that right and then you're gonna have like any kinds of in-betweens here but the important thing is uh, is to try to emulate what the lens is doing first you know it's like a so if it's a, a picture like this that looks like the the, the both ears are completely visible and the face is completely flat right so that means like first the picture is being taken from a distance so it could be for example 50 millimeters here in the face still would look kind of small uh, kind of flat but then if you get a close-up shot like this and the face you know it's like let's say if this shot here was just like a crop of this like a close-up shot maybe an 85 would produce like a similar result you know it's like so always trying to track what the what the lenses are doing so, you know, this is like to start with the likeness, obviously. It's trying to mimic a little bit of the lenses. So I spoke about the planes, I spoke about the volume of the cranium here. Other volumes in the cranium that you can actually take in account are, for example, like uh, things like the brow ridge in here. So you have like this brow ridge around here, right? And then you have like, normally there's a little bit of a split right around here. And also there is a triangle that's being created. So you're going to have like you have your your temporalis line going this way. And then you're going to have kind of like a volume that's going to start forming this way. So this is going to be split. This one is going to split in two. Going to have like some muscles right here in your forehead doing some uh, eye split. And at the end, you're going to end up like with a little triangle around here. right? Like So that little triangle is kind of like imaginary, right? So uh, this is also helpful, you know, it's like in the structure of the, the whole thing. In terms of nose, the nose here, you're gonna have like your, you know, it's like the, 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 the bone itself happening around here, maybe a little higher, maybe mine is a little bit too low. And then uh, some people, I mean, like if you have a boxer, for example, this is probably gonna be very uh, well represented. For example, like you're probably gonna have this, you know, it's like this bump Kind of represent a little bit like that if you have a, a boxer nose you know because of the breakage in there uh and then uh, so but adding a little bit of that actually helps as well uh in terms of like the most common mistakes now that people uh make i would say like uh, the first one is to actually try to match the face from the front view without caring too much about the other views so sometimes if it's a portrait and you look at the portrait like this it's like oh man it looks so good right and then Someone start posting the other angles of their model, and then the model start falling apart. You know, everything is out of place. And why does that happen? I would say, let's paint a few areas here. Let's uh, let's just turn off my uh, so I have like this coloring here. Let's just colorize everything. Let's say gray. Let's just color here. So let's go to the highest level. Color. Oops, did I do it? Interesting, it didn't colorize it for me. Oh, I think it's because my RGB is very, very tiny. Let's go to RGB again. Let's go color field object, okay? So let's use some coloring here. Let's try with red. And let me point like to a few points where I think it would be very important for you to pay attention, uh, you know, uh, during this process of sculpting to, uh, to have like a consistent face or facial structure that doesn't fall apart when you uh, when you switch angles you know so a few uh, a few points here so for example this area right here the corner of the mouth let's go again let's turn off this so the corners of the mouth in here so this area right here from the front right like it looks it looks pretty good in there but a common mistake is like this a lot of people sculpt this area very flat right so this entire thing here looks flat like this very very common so from the front you get like a very similar result you know it's like it looks good but then you start turning around it's like oh oh, oh something looks looks we, we what, what right so a little weird so tracking that point and making sure that you have enough depth in relation to the you know it's like to the to the neutral face in this case he has a very slight smile a little tiny bit of smile so it's actually pulling things a little bit higher and a little bit deeper in here but overall i would say like you know it's like in this case if i was more neutral probably like it's slightly you know more forward like that would be more neutral right so this is a good point to pay attention uh is this uh this little area right there the the, the very corner of the lips uh this uh, the second one here i would say 
is the the volume of the zygomatic so the zygomatic uh, bone right here so this area right here right so let's go like you know it's like if you go let's just keep it around here so this volume here of the zygomatic you know uh the, another common mistake is that you get it like you get uh, let's say uh if i switch like without color here let's see uh, if I have like something and I start sculpting this volume here to be very visible, you know, it's like so you start digging very deeply in there and everything, right? You see that mine is a little visible, but it's very subtle, right? Uh, at some point, you know, it's like you start looking at it, it was like, huh, yeah, it looks from the front. And again, when you go to the profile, then the psychomatic doesn't have enough volume. And especially when you go from the top like this, you don't have enough frame for the eyes. Right, like this is basically the frame of the eyes. So you're gonna have your your orbital cavity here, which is basically the hole for the eyeball, right? And then this is basically the frame of the eyeball. You're gonna have the eyeball sitting in there. It's gonna be floating, suspended by a bunch of different muscle muscles. And then you're gonna have like depending of the age, obviously the eye bag is gonna get a little bit bigger, like in this case, right? So things get a little bit more saggy. Uh, but overall, I mean, like if I deflated this, if I brought this whole area in, right, I would start to see a little bit more of this edge here of the, the cavity itself. And this cavity would actually go all the way around. So if I did a little drawing here, you would say, you would see that the cavity would do something kind of like, it has a little bit of an angle, it goes down like that. And it's interesting because, uh, for women and men, they are different, right? Like for women, they are much more round overall, like the shape is more round. And for men, they are a little bit more squarish like that. But the important thing to notice is that they make this frame, you know, it's like this frame for the eyeball area in here. So this frame is important to have from all angles. So if I go, for example, from an angle like this, and then I sculpted this area here very deep like that, right? So from the, again, like from the front, Maybe it's gonna look okay. You know, it looks a little angry there, but it looks okay. But then you look from the side, this is too deep. Another common mistake, you know, the eye corner to be too deep as well. Again, from the front looks correct. You go to the side, it looks too deep. Or the opposite, it looks too flat. Look again, from the front, it looks good, right? Go to the side, doesn't have enough depth in here. So depth, a corner of the mouth, corner of the eye, very important landmarks, you know? Uh, you know, anything that has to do with the volume in the 3D space, you know, try not to go and, and try to match something like perfectly from one angle and just forget about it. Keep orbiting around your model, right? Another uh, thing that the, the, the lack of zygomatic uh, uh, bone structure is going to do is that from that angle, when you start orbiting like that and you see that angle right there, the far uh, side, you're gonna see either you're gonna have too much of it, right? Some people model like very exaggerated, or you're not gonna have enough of it. Same thing with this area here. I mean, like, uh, let's just go back here. Same thing with this area here, for example, like the, the muzzle in relation to the sides of the mouth in here. Sometimes you get like this very, very pronounced like that. Like it looks very funny looking, right? People start sculpting the, let's say the, jo the jaws are here. And the jaw is going to get very, very low and everything is going to look weird like that, you know, because they're trying to exaggerate too much, right? So it changes completely the profile, the silhouette of the character, which is very important to preserve at all times. Another common mistake is like, you know, it's part of that uh, lack of this depth around here. So if I have, if I don't have enough depth for the corner of the mouth, this entire area here is starting to get flat, right? Start to get flat like this. And all of a sudden, like you have those models with this, mouth that looks like this not uncommon you can find a lot of them looking like that you know not enough depth so it basically like affects everything around it right so it can affect the, even the chin area here so make sure you have that relationship correct in the same vein for the another common mistake is the way that people sculpt the, the chin so the chin normally the tendency is to sculpt everything as a single form right without adding a little bit of um, I would say uh, like a, a subtle split, you know, it's like, so let me do it like very strongly here so you can see what I'm talking about. So for example, if I create here a little split right around here, right? 
And then I imagine that this little form right here, you see there's a form that's going like this, right? If I imagine this, this form here is actually going towards the chin and breaking up towards like that. It's kind of like goes and breaks up there. So now I have like one form in the middle and I have another two secondary forms on the sides. So that's how you normally have to build your chin. You know, it's like, it's try to split this in at least three forms. You're gonna find like different variations and everything. But in general, you see like in my case here is a very, very subtle split. It's not even very visible in there. I might have to actually incorporate a little bit more of this little split. But uh, it really helps to actually define this plane in here. There's another plane that's this one here that's happening towards here, right? Like you see this little plane. So it's kind of like a change in direction right there. Um, and then another thing that happens as well is when you look from a profile like this uh, or a three quarters view like this, sometimes people sculpt the masseter too strong, right? So kind of like a, almost like a cartoon, right? I want to make this guy like, oh, he's going to be like chiseled, right? Super chiseled. And look how much it changes the profile here in those relationships, right? It changes quite a lot. So it's always a matter of like, okay, depending on the type of character you're sculpting, obviously, you're probably gonna need like a strong masseter here at some point, like a warrior, right? Some Someone very strong. Uh, but in general, it's all about like observing what your references are telling you and then try to uh, incorporate this to the model, right? Like, so if you're orbiting around and you notice that something, you know, it's like you already tweaked this whole area here of the jowls and they look kind of like they are in a good spot, but you're still seeing something that looks, you know, it's like too wide in there. That means that something else is happening. So it's not in the jowls, it's not in the chin, it's probably something deeper. And in that case, you're gonna find out that probably like the jawline is, you know, it's like it's too too wide in here. So the mandible is way too wide on that on that area. Uh, another thing that happens, let's say, is the depth of the ears in relation to this to the skull. So sometimes people model the ears. Let me just try to bring it like, without destroying too much. But the ears are placed like this, right? And then what they try to do, they try to compensate by bringing the jawline here so the you know it's like your mandible to accommodate for that right and it, there's another mistake here that's kind of hidden as well but you're gonna i'm gonna tell you about it soon so for example like i'm gonna try to make sure that this reads very squarish right very squarish right here and the ears right there and then look from the front again it was like oh there's nothing too wrong about it maybe i can even open it a bit like that oh it looks kind of normal doesn't it but then you start looking around and people orbit the model. You know, it's like something is really, really wrong in here. So that's another common mistake is to actually have the ears too close to the face. And in that case, it creates a very short, um, you know, everything is connected, obviously, but it's going to create a very short uh, mandible. And then the other way around is to actually have a, this distance too big. So you have something like that, that's like a kilometer. So your zygomatic bone here is like, it's, it has a long way to go. In my case here, I, I'm kind of like, I'm not looking at the references right now, but uh, it's almost like feels like he could come back just slightly, a little bit like that. But uh, I think I'm gonna keep for now like this, I'm gonna have to double check my references in there. And uh, so there's another one here, another mistake, which is to always end the corner of your mandible right against the you know it's like the the ear in here obviously if you're talking about the bones themselves yeah they might be doing this but remember that covering the bones you have muscles you have other structures that have fat tissue right so uh one thing that i tend to do is to always go a little bit further than that line so if my line was around here right like that little line so i try you see like that volume that i have it goes beyond it so there's a I'm gonna just do dotted line right here so I added that little volume behind it, which is basically like from this area right here, from the corner of the mandible, there is a little bit of a filler, right? Like it's almost like, a, imagine a curtain that's actually hanging from this uh, structure in here and kind of like going towards that. So I try to do that. And also from time to time, I incorporate things like, let's say like if I have some wrinkles here, going this way, right around here, I can actually create some of those wrinkles 
around that area because remember like everything is alive right like all the structures are very flexible and then over time you know it's like doing motions with your body especially if you're an older person some of those wrinkles they're going to start creating marks and they're going to be basically baked into your skin it's kind of like this is actually a memory of all the facial expressions done right over many many years they always uh, the, the wrinkles always break in the same spot and at the end they they work as kind of like a, a memory of that facial expression right so you know it's like try to imagine those things when you're sculpting as well uh, so ear position I already spoke about the corner of the mouth spoke about the chin doing those splits let's talk about the lips for example lips and this other area underneath the lips so for the lips in his case here they are super thin but normally if you have someone with more lips uh, you would have like three different volumes so the first volume would be kind of like this one in the center and the other two volumes would be like those supporting little pillows right here on the side. So we have like one, two, three volumes. And in the bottom, we're going to have basically two volumes. So we're going to have like two around here. And you see that I actually ended this volume around here on purpose. Uh, the tendency is for people, another mistake is to actually sculpt the volume of the lips all the way across, all the way to the, towards the corner, right? Like all the way really towards the corner like that when in fact there is a breakup that happens around here so they they actually end a little bit prematurely right here and then there's a very subtle little line that's created and then the continuation is a, se is a separate volume right here so this is going to be lower than this volume here this volume is going to be a little bit higher right so we're going to have a nice little split in there now for this under area here normally People consider two volumes, but I actually consider three. So you have like this area right here, another volume. But I consider the center piece here another volume because some people they have this very pronounced sometimes with some lines in here, something like that, right? And then again, like the chin, in the case of the chin, obviously I just create a breakup in here, but if I split the whole thing, I would create like a basically like those volumes being larger like that, and then maybe a subdivision of it around here, and then this other area right in the middle and then for the chin like I said before something like this and then those secondary lines going towards the side right try like to imagine like those things as separations you know it's like things they are separate so like for your philtrum right here which is this depression you have right here uh, you know there is a peak so you're gonna have like if we exaggerate so you have a, have a peak around here right you have a uh, the deepest spot right there and then again like this volume uh, depending on the type of uh, facial structure, obviously, sometimes you're going to find someone who has a very well-defined, you know, it's like separation between the nose and the muzzle. So you're going to have something that's a little more defined like that, deeper. You, again, like you're going to have this entire volume here. There is this volume right here that sometimes people don't add it. Oops. But this little volume right here, right, that creates this little dimple right in the corner. So that's a, you know, it's like it's an important landmark to create as well. I can go a little bit lower in there. Uh, what happens here uh, sometimes as well is that you're going to have your uh, your nasal labial fold right here. And then depending on the person, sometimes you're going to get, uh, you know, it's like this uh, vo uh, volume of the muzzle in here split around here. So kind of like goes towards like that. Creates almost like a diagonal like this, right? And then you're going to have a separation here. So sometimes you're going to see people with, uh, you know, like some double fold in here. Sometimes you get another fold that's kind of like a, uh, other than the nasal labial. And another interesting one is that uh, the nasal labial continues, right? So it's going to continue, but in a very subtle way towards that. And then right around here, some people get a little dimple just around here. So, you know, it's like right around there. And then there is volume to be incorporated around here as well, not only around here. And then for the tip of the nose, the tendency is to get this line, kind of like again imaginary, to go and wrap around here. And then you have a split right around here. Some people are going to have this split very, very visible, depending on the person. Some of them are going to have this split. It's all underneath, right? Like you have your cartilage and all the muscles in there. Uh, and uh, some some people have very visible right here, right? So it's always trying to imagine like the separation between those volumes and try to incorporate to your character. But at the same time, if you do in a very arbitrary way, uh, uh, without paying attention to your references, then everything becomes a little bit abstract, you know. And uh, so 
uh, I would say like uh, try to keep those volumes in mind but when you're sculpting always try to uh, refer to your references and see what the skin is doing because remember like people are not just skin and and and, and, and uh, muscles right like there's a lot going on there's like a lot of fat tissue underneath the skin there's the fact that someone older has a lot of sagginess there are some fillers and other things that we don't consider when we're just sculpting something for anatomy purposes but when you're trying to sculpt something naturalistic where the skin is actually flexible and and rides over like a this massive structure of uh, you know it's like muscles and and tendons and all kinds of stuff and blood vessels and you know it's like the fat tissue uh there's a lot going on in there like it's very very complex but at the same time it's very very subtle right like uh, everything looks very very subtle so uh in terms of landmarks i think that's uh, about it when it comes like to this main structure when it comes to the nose in relation to the eyes for example you said like his eyes that are a bit more forward you know, it's like some people have them pretty, pretty deep into the face. But in his case, he has a little bit more of a little buggy, right? Like kind of like they go forward a little bit. So uh, I normally start the eyes very naturalistic, kind of like uh, in a neutral position. And then later on, I actually pull them out. And then I adjust with the eyeballs and everything to actually mimic what I'm seeing in the pictures. In his case, you know, it's like the eyes, they look a little bit more like this. And uh, and also there is the, the whole factor which is the asymmetry, right? You see, like I started some asymmetry here with the eyes. This one on the left looks a little bit more, uh, not wide, right? It's just the, the upper eyelid is a little bit more revealed than the uh, than in this side here, right? Speaking of the eyelids, you're gonna notice one thing here, which is this angle right here. See, like the from this point right here at the top, so right around there uh, to the bottom right here, you see like the, the the relationship between the upper eyelid to the lower eyelid there is an angle so the upper one is more forward the lower one is more uh, uh, backward right so what happens in here is that like in a neutral pose like this that's expected the eyeball is going to be sitting in that area in there a little bit uh, a little bit higher you know it's like you you're never gonna for example like put the center of your iris right in the center of this you know it's like you're always going to try to represent to make it look more naturalistic the eye you see like the the lower edge of my iris is barely touching the you know it's like the lower eyelid but the upper part is semi-hidden that's important to create this kind of like neutral peaceful uh expression you know if you create something that's too wide it's going to look like scared right uh if this angle here is exaggerated for example if you see too much of the upper lid much more forward than the the lower lid that happens when someone is looking down for example so this lid goes more forward and this one kind of retracts so the eyeball sits deeper inside of the inside of the cavity the orbital cavity and the same happens when you're looking up right so the the the, the lower eyelid is going to go forward and the the upper eyelid is going to retract and go kind of like inside of the cavity as well so we're going to kind of like reverse this relationship here if you're looking up so you know it's like paying attention to this angle is very important and then when it comes to the relationship between you know it's like the eye position in relation to for example the corner of the nose it's going to be very relative to the type of reference you have some people are going to have like a very forward nose for example which is fairly exaggerated let me see what okay let me just uh, I'm gonna cancel that um, I'm just sketching here anyway so some people have like a very forward nose I'm just exaggerating obviously and you know it's like if you're looking at the drawing books for example it's not the kind of like a neutral or average face that someone is going to draw but you can definitely find that you know it's like in in, in actual people in the same way you're going to see people with much flatter faces right like going to have someone who has a flatter kind of face like that right maybe like a nose breakage or something or if someone like a like a let's say like a different ethnicities like a asian right you're going to have like maybe this area here is going to be more flat towards the you know the eyes and then obviously the corner of the eye is going to have a different you know it's like the uh, caruncle or caruncula going to have a different type of structure the fold's going to be different as well but uh, you know it's like you're going to find all kinds of variant uh, variations but at the same time if you're sculpting something or someone a little bit more average uh, uh, 
when it comes like to let's say like in his case Caucasian uh, then you are expecting to have like the eye a little bit closer like the line of let's say like the upper lid a little bit closer to the line right here the corner of the nose right uh, and then obviously again like some people are gonna probably like have this a little bit deeper some people are gonna have more forward like that but average try to create a nice little curvature between uh, an elegant curvature between this line right here and that right and that follows you know like right at the corner and then towards the nasal labia right here and then you have an offset of that which is the you know your zygomatic right here and then again like the zygomatic you're gonna have like this structure going towards your masseter in there so everything has to have a certain kind of rhythm you know it's like everything has a rhythm when it comes to the face and then uh, observing those landmarks are so important you know it's like a, the depth that things have in relation to other things everything is a relationship like the nose in relation to the to the mouth and the corners of each one of them the corner of the inner part of the eye in here in relation to the corner of the nose in there the little base of it everything uh, changes a lot of how your model gonna look like for example like another mistake is to have either the corner right here so the caruncle or caruncula too deep to the point that you know it's like huh doesn't quite work so best way to investigate go from the bottom like that right you're gonna see like oh my god this is very deep in there you should not do that uh, the other one is to go too shallow right like you go too far like that obviously I'm just exaggerating here but some people actually they go as far as doing something similar to that and then anything in between for example like this whole cavity right here some people build this entire structure here very very flat they don't have enough depth in here so this entire area this is a very common one too is to sculpt something like this you know that things don't have enough depth in that area so actually everything blends towards the nose right here but without having like a, a, a split you know it's like a separation between what's the nose and what's the you know it's like the eye bags in there there's no respect for the structure of the face and uh, i think like the best way for you to try to simplify that and imagine how things are is to have again like make things planar right so you're making a plane like that and now now you know that the plane goes all the way into here and then you naturally you're going to start paying attention to okay so there's another plane starting right around here but this one should be respected that's because that's the side of the nose right there right so starting to add those planes to actually try to define you know it's like a separating different forms from each other same thing for example for the nose in here there's a little form that goes right around here is a little flat little plane right around here sometimes we, we forget to add it right and then uh, another thing I try to do is incorporate a little bit of this flatness right here I'm exaggerating I'm gonna make it obviously a little bit more subtle in my final model right but uh, you know all those things they help if I wanna maybe like flatten the side right here and maybe the tip even like make a flatter around here for example you know it's like all those things have uh, help to actually define uh, those forms you know so I can sh start seeing things in a little bit of more of a abstract way so you know it's like uh, so pay attention to the planes very important the structure of the face depends on them uh, pay attention to uh, volumes like important landmarks like I said the, the you know it's like zygomatic bone the structure of the the head and uh, also another one that's very important it's this very corner of your brows here so for example right around here what happens sometimes is either people have too much volume I mean again exaggerating so I'm gonna just build like a Neanderthal right here right so this goes all the way forward and don't get me wrong some people do have some weird structures that might actually mimic a little bit what I'm doing here right like some Neanderthal blood in there <laughs> um, but overall, I mean, like, again, going to have to check against your references and make sure that you don't have too much of that exaggeration, especially considering if you're going to groom and add some eyebrows in there later. Once you add the eyebrows, this is going to double, right? Like, so you're going to see something very, very, you know, thick in there. And uh, so double check that. This relationship is the same for reverse, not enough of it. So you start, like, to, you know, it's like to miss that volume in there. And then there's a relationship between the upper and the uh, and the under part right so you're gonna see like you have your eyebrow in there that I, I was describing but then this area here 
the silhouette uh, is not talking to the zygomatic in a in a uh, correct way. So for example, like uh, either I make this too deep right here. So you have like this kind of like almost like a, a cartoon, you know, it's like super exaggerated separation between those two forms. Or again, the opposite, right? Or it's too flat. You're gonna see a face that looks like this, you know, and it's like too flat. So you don't have enough of it. So always trying to find a balance, you know, it's like between those structures. For example, like if someone has a very puffy upper eyelid right here, maybe has this structure a little bit puffier like that, right? See how much that's gonna extend and how much that's gonna affect the the silhouette in here and try to counter that a little bit, you know? It's like it has, to, at the end of the day, it has to look natural. Uh, in my case here, some of my forms, I started very, very strongly with them and I started like actually softening things a lot, but I still see some of them, maybe like this corner right here, I'm gonna maybe like tweak a little bit, but again, just a tiny bit. And that's gonna have to be checked against my reference to see if I'm not removing too much, you know? But again, like it's something that might look a little bit more natural if I do a little tap in there, right? For the zygomatic, another common mistake right here uh, is uh, having the zygomatic muscles a little bit too deep. That happens maybe if someone, again, like emaciated or dehydrated, right? You're gonna have those muscles sitting a little bit lower in there, right? But in general, if it's a fairly healthy face, you're probably gonna have some fillers in here. If it's a woman, you're probably gonna have like more volume, it's gonna be nice and rounder, right? The zygomatic in here is gonna have some fillers. For example, the cheekbone here is gonna look a little lower, right? They're gonna have like this nice, uh, you know, volumes in there. Uh, in case of a woman as well, uh, the brow ridge is gonna be much, much less. So you're gonna get like this brow ridge much softer and the head overall is gonna have more like this baby looking structure, you know? It's like, so you're gonna look at from the side, it's a little bit more round overall. In men, you're gonna have more of the brow ridge and more of a slope. I'm gonna exaggerate here so you can see. So more of a slope like that. And with women, it's gonna be a little bit more of a round kind of babyish face like that, right? So all those things, you know, it's like they add, in, uh, you know, it's like to the, to the whole idea of what I'm trying to sculpt. Then there are the relationship. I mean, like if you sculpted the, 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 the zygomatic bone correctly, making that frame for the eyeballs, like I said, right? And then you have your, your zygomatic muscles and you know that the zygomatic major is gonna connect to the corner of the mouth. And then the zygomatic minor is gonna connect, uh, uh, you know, it's like to the, to the inner part of it. Then you, you know that you are actually, you know, it's like created this kind of like a structure that hangs from the zygomatic bone in here towards the side of the face. And that starts to work a little bit better, you know. Maybe around here, for example, when you get to this area, depending on the person, you're gonna have much more filler, right? So you're gonna have something that looks more like this. So you have like this more squarish line right there. In his case, I'm kind of keeping things a little bit deeper because I want to see the separation around the nasal labio in here in relation to the zygomatic uh, muscles, right? But then, uh, yeah, it all is going to depend of the, of the type of character you're sculpting. In terms of eyes, let's talk about eyes, for example. Uh, the tendency is to sculpt eyes like a cartoon, right? So you kind of like make like a very perfectly round in both corners. They are very symmetrical, right? But in fact, the eyes in general you're always gonna have some kind of offsets. Offsets are everywhere in the body, in the human body. And what I mean by that is this, for example, if I cut a line from this area here all the way to the side, so that's the diagonal right here, right? That's probably gonna be like the deepest point right here. So gonna be the, the, the highest point of my eyelid. And this is gonna be the lowest of the lower eyelid, right? I'm exaggerating obviously. Some people, depending on you know, the type of eye motion, you're probably gonna have like this changing a lot. If you, some, someone is looking out outwards, for example, you're gonna change that relationship. Things gonna start moving around, right? Same if you're looking inwards, you're probably gonna get more of that, right? But then, um, but then, yeah, so like the, trying to observe those things, you know, it's like when you look at the reference, try to break that reference in almost like in an abstract way, as you can see just like simple shapes, you know, it's like a, a straight line, for example right? Like this area here, for example, for the top eyelid, it's almost like it's broken into a few straight lines. So I have a straight line here, another one here, another one there, right? But then 
eventually you start actually blending things together make things a little bit more round same with this area right here like this wrinkle that i sculpted right here i started much rounder and then i check my reference and then i start to flatten and get a little bit more of this straight line here and then it started to actually curve towards the inside this area here, I, I'm not gonna say I see lots of mistakes, but it's interesting to observe how that works, right? Like you get the wrinkle in there, and then it starts wrapping around here. If you get some secondary ones, they're gonna do the same thing. If you have like some uh, very, very tiny wrinkles coming from this area right here, they're gonna start to hang from that inner part towards that. And then when you get to this area here, you're gonna start seeing them doing something more interesting, which is creating this structures like that you know it's like when you have some kind of like angry face and everything contracts so like they kind of like create those interesting patterns going towards the center in here when you know have an angry face but in general those lines in here if you have a relaxed face they're gonna always try to do something like this you know it's like go towards that and then when you go around here they're gonna start going up so like the direction of the the wrinkle is gonna always go like this so they're gonna go up and then you're gonna start going towards that, right? Like this. And then when you get to this area, they're gonna start coming together that way until they meet around there. And when you get around here, same thing. They're gonna go and flare out like that. With the mouth, same thing. You're gonna have wrinkles going this way and that way. They're gonna start going up like that. Same with the lower, right? Straight first, and then you're gonna start curving towards the corner. What happens here, uh, the, the reason why you have the wrinkles like this, it's motivated by the way that the, the, the muscles underneath the structure are actually behaving. So if you have something, let's say like you have this circle right here, so you have like this muscle, and then the muscle fibers, they're actually following the same kind of circular pattern like that. So when you have something like this, the, the fibers going this way, there is a you know so the wrinkles are created in a per perpendicular way so like in the opposite direction of the fibers of the muscle so if the muscles are going like this right when you compress them basically like they are kind of like stretching and contracting you're going to create the wrinkles in the opposite direction same for the eyes right it's going to have the same type of muscle fibers going around here and they're contracting and stretching and you're going to get the same kind of effect you know it's like the, the wrinkles going the opposite way but uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the general stuff that I think like people get in trouble the most, I would say that yes, all those areas that I just mentioned, especially corners uh, and the relationship between those elements and how they sit inside of the face, right? So you can see like what I did so far in terms of sculpting. Uh, let me just do like a preview of my HD geometry sculpting here so you can see what was sculpting in HD. This is all super fine detail, you know, that was sculpted in, uh, in HD. Uh, I have like a close to 100 million polygons just for the face and neck and shoulders, right? So it's plenty of detail. That's why, you know, when you look at the renders, you're going to start seeing a lot of fine detail in there later when I have obviously the uh, a more definitive albedo for him then you're gonna start seeing things a little bit more uh, more realistic you know it's like right now it's still not very far into the process just two weeks so you're gonna get better eventually and uh yeah so that's what i had for you guys today if you want to check uh some of my classes online i have this website it's called www.flyonthewall.studio and I teach digital portraits, if you didn't know. <laughs> uh, so I have plenty of courses in there. You know, it's like, yeah, I have like bundles like this. You can buy three of them for a single price or, or single ones like that. And, uh, and then I have like a beautiful gallery that you guys can check from like my previous students. This is all like uh, my students work and all incredible work. You know, some of them actually, they knew a lot right before they got the classes so i cannot take credit for you know everything but some of them actually started very you know it's like a, a very simply um without having a lot of notion about how to render or anything like that or how to sculpt like fine detail and uh, the evolution was pretty incredible you know it's like so check their work in there check if uh, the classes uh, are interesting to you all those things I spoke about today, uh, I including those classes, they are like 32 hours classes. And uh, more than that, probably like close to 40 at the end of the day. 
and I go through the entire process, like building, like from this, uh, from scratch, all the way to the super fine detail, grooming, uh, hair, all that stuff. You know, it's like so. Check if you have the chance. And uh, I think I'm gonna keep it short, right? Like not that short, but I mean short enough. And I hope you guys take advantage of anything that I, I spoke about today. You know, it's like a, it's kind of like a generic thing, but. Basically, the things I see the most, you know, it's like this is my ninth class I'm teaching right now uh, in about two, two and a half years, taking a long break actually from November to September now. I, I stopped that last November, so restarted just now, so a little rusty, but getting back. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's like some of the most common mistakes I noticed, like students making, you know, it's like and people around the internet. So if that can be helpful, you know, uh, spread the word, help me to share the videos. Uh, Click subscribe and, you know, it's like click, click the little bell for uh, for getting notifications. And uh, please share the video if you like it, if you think someone else is going to take advantage of it. Okay. Have a great night. It's almost time for me to go to bed. And I talk to you in the next video. See ya. <laughs>